Few words are more likely to get an anesthesiologist's attention than myasthenia gravis. In anesthesia, we routinely administer paralyzing medications to make it safer for either the anesthesia and or the surgical portion of the case. But what's the relationship between paralyzing medications and myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects how muscles function to begin with? My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City and June is Myasthenia Gravis Awareness Month which seemed like the perfect opportunity to review this important condition and what relationship anesthesia has with it. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. As always, this video does not contain medical advice. It's just a YouTube video. If you need medical advice, you should talk to your doctor. Myasthenia gravis is a relatively rare autoimmune condition where antibodies attack the postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction. All that to say that when patients have myasthenia gravis, they experience weakness that can range from a little bit of weakness of the eye muscles to weakness of the head and neck muscles, and even to the diaphragm, which plays a critical role in being able to breathe. The muscle weakness that patients can experience can include the arms and legs, which makes this condition really difficult to live with because going through one's daily life and just doing daily activities can lead to such profound muscle fatigue that you can't really move. When myasthenia gravis becomes so severe, a patient can actually experience what's called a myasthenic crisis, which can lead to such profound weakness that it can be life-threatening and requires emergency medical treatment. People who have myasthenia gravis typically have their condition managed by a neurologist on an ongoing outpatient basis. I should also just point out that there's a related condition that's called Lambert-Eaton myasthenia syndrome, which is similar but has some important differences in terms of how it works mechanistically and then also what the treatments are. As compared to myasthenia gravis, the Lambert-Eaton myasthenia syndrome tends to be more related with malignancies, certain types of cancers, especially certain types of lung cancer. Suffice it to say that anesthesiologists need to be familiar with both of these conditions because they can both impact anesthetic management in different ways. Anesthesiologists routinely use different types of paralytics or muscle relaxants as a part of safely taking care of a patient both from the anesthesia standpoint and also for surgery. On the anesthesia side of things, it can be important to administer a muscle relaxant in order to facilitate endotracheal intubation, which is just to say in order to place a breathing tube. That's because muscle relaxants have the ability to open up vocal cords, so instead of being closed like this, they actually appear open like this, so an endotracheal tube can pass through. I'll also just point out that this only happens when a patient is already under general anesthesia and not aware of anything that's going on. On the surgical side of things, it's very common for certain types of surgeries to necessitate having a patient stay completely motionless. And for that reason, anesthesiologists continue to administer paralyzing medications throughout the duration of surgery. A common example of this is laparoscopic surgery, where surgeons make very small incisions that are about this big so that they can insert instruments and cameras through those incisions to have a surgery done inside the abdomen without having to make a large surgical scar that would maybe be this big. In the case of laparoscopic surgery, patients generally need to be paralyzed because otherwise the diaphragm would move in such a way that it would disrupt surgery to the point of making it impossible to be technically done. Patients with myasthenia gravis have different levels of sensitivity and resistance to the different types of muscle relaxants that are commonly used. Succinylcholine is a short-acting muscle relaxant that typically works for about five to seven minutes and is very routinely used to facilitate endotracheal intubation. As it turns out, patients with myasthenia gravis are very resistant to succinylcholine and it can be a little unpredictable to dose this medication appropriately for intubation. Keeping in mind that the way that myasthenia gravis works is to attack the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, you can imagine that there are just fewer receptors available. And so succinylcholine, which acts on these receptors, just doesn't have as many receptors to act on, which is why myasthenia gravis patients are more resistant to succinylcholine. On the other hand, patients with myasthenia gravis tend to be more susceptible to the action of longer-acting, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants like rocuronium and vecuronium. 
That's because these agents work through competitive inhibition of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And because there aren't that many of those receptors, then it doesn't take that many molecules of a drug to competitively inhibit these receptors. Once surgery is finished and it's time for us to reverse paralysis and then wake a patient up, one of the medications that's frequently used is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor called neostigmine. As it turns out, one of the mainstay treatments for myasthenia gravis is peridostigmine, which works through basically the exact same mechanism as this reversal agent that we use called neostigmine. As a consequence, it can actually be problematic to administer neostigmine to patients with myasthenia gravis because it can lead to overdosing the amount of acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that the patient receives, which can lead to a condition called cholinergic crisis, which in and of itself can be life-threatening. For that reason, another option that we have to reverse paralysis for patients with myasthenia gravis is a medication called Sugamidex, which works through a different mechanism to basically just bind up the longer-acting neuromuscular blocker. When I'm planning to take care of a patient who has myasthenia gravis, one of the things that I try to assess is whether I can safely avoid giving any muscle relaxants at all. Sometimes that's not possible, but sometimes it is possible to do that. And one strategy that I implement is administering an infusion of a potent opioid called remifentanil. While it technically doesn't paralyze a patient, it's such a profound acting opioid that it functionally stops any type of movement as a response to pain. Post-operative planning is also really important when taking care of patients with myasthenia gravis because it's not unusual that they might need additional respiratory support or at least monitoring in the immediate post-operative period. There are a number of predictors that we can use to determine the likelihood of a patient needing post-operative ventilatory support. And these predictors are actually routinely tested on the anesthesia board exams because they're such an important thing to know as part of routine practice. Those predictors include duration of disease, severity of disease as measured by the amount of medication that a patient takes, comorbidities like COPD, and whether the patient has a smaller than normal lung capacity. An excellent resource for healthcare professionals who want to review the anesthetic management of myasthenia gravis is openanesthesia.org, which I've listed in the description below. In addition to the professional understanding of myasthenia gravis, which is obviously very important to me as an anesthesia resident, it's also personally very important to me because someone who I'm very close with is affected by this condition. And for that reason, if you enjoyed this video, consider donating to the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, which provides really important resources for people who are living with this condition. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.